Everyone, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jillian Campana. I'm a professor here, as well as the Associate Dean for the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. This session is about spring 2021 and the modes of instruction, updates on remote work policies, and AUC's continued COVID-19 management measures. So the format of this conversation will be a little bit different than we have done in past campus conversations. We'll take live questions from those of you who are watching in addition to the questions that you already sent in. Uh, when we get to those questions, you have the option of writing the question in the chat, or if you would prefer to ask it, you can raise your hand and then I will call on you and unmute you. We have a lot of questions already, so we'll see what we get to. We appreciate, regardless of whether you ask it on the chat or whether you ask it to us, we would like you to introduce yourself so we know who's asking the question. So before we get going, I'd like to introduce everyone who's on the call today. We have Dina Borai, who is the Vice President for Student Life. We have Ashraf Hatem, who is the AUC counselor. We have Provost Ehab Abdel Rahman. We have Vice President for Management and Operations, Shireen Shaker. We have Aziza Alozi, Associate Provost for Transformative Learning and Teaching. We have Ahmed Tolba, Associate Professor and Head of the Faculty Committee to study the best methods for face-to-face -face return. We have Sarah Rafat, who is the Senior Associate Vice President for Human Resources. And we have President Francis Ricciardoni. So I'd like to take a moment now to turn it over to President Ricciardoni for some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Campana, for hosting this conversation today. And uh, commendations to you again for the uh, lovely event and the launching of your book uh, that we did all together the other night with some students and faculty. I would, uh, I do appreciate this opportunity to speak with our community, um, first on COVID and, and then uh, on another administrative matter that's also good news. On COVID, <laughs> we all wish that we had never heard the word and, and never been experiencing this. I'll say up front, we really miss our students, especially all of us, the faculty and staff, we live for our students to be physically present with us on this campus and we want you all back in the greatest numbers at the earliest possible time. All that said, uh, none of us expect that, that that's going to be soon, and that's the topic that we'll discuss in detail uh, today. Fortunately, we've all heard there is light at the end of the tunnel with vaccines being approved for uh, testing and use and deployment around the world, but the tunnel is still long. The worst, the hardest is still before us. Um, whether in this country or, or this university or others around the world, we know things will get worse before they get better. So uh, we have to keep up our courage and our commitment and our faith that things will get better. On that latter point, the confidence and faith that we have at, at AUC is where I'd like to just spend just a couple of minutes. Two hours from now, thanks to the work of Dr. Uh, Ashraf, who will be speaking more on this, the Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research and a good number of university presidents from around Egypt will be joining us at an AUC hosted webinar. Some will be physically present to compare notes on how we are all coping with this pandemic around Egypt. We will be presenting uh, a best practice that we have developed at AUC that is industry standard in the United States. That is to say our, our uh, testing, tracking, uh, and tracing uh, procedures that are all reflected in a dashboard that I hope many of the viewers here have already seen. If you haven't, please check it out. That dashboard gives the statistics we publish. I think we're the only ones in Egypt who put out our um, statistics on how COVID is affect affecting our community, our students, our faculty, and staff. That's critically important to give us the data and analysis we need to make decisions about uh, coming back onto campus physically, what we can do, uh, what is working, what is not, and, and how to protect the health of our people who are present on campus. That is what the best universities in the US do, and we can, and, and Shireen Shocker or 
others uh, can speak about how we're, we're doing that. Um, also in this context of, um, of COVID, uh, I wanna thank the, uh, the students for what they're, just the, the resilience and the courage and the, and, the, and the discipline and the hard work that they're applying against the, the stress, the strain and the challenges and commend equally the faculty for working so hard to uh, make it possible to get our students through this dreadful period. Uh, we had all hoped it would be mitigated by now. Of course, it's only getting worse. The virus is, is the pandemic is getting worse around the world. Um, but we've, we've shown we can do this and we can get our students through this and we will. However, we work out the technicalities, we'll be talking about that in this meeting. In uh, further against this backdrop, I just want to remind everybody, as I, uh, I've done broad compliments, let me give some specific citations of the terrific work we're continuing to do and the national and international recognition we're getting for that. Let me just mention uh, about uh, over a dozen, 14, 15 uh, faculty members by name who have recently got very, very high honors and make, make all of us very proud here at AUC. Um, one who's got a, uh, a, a single uh, honor, she's not part of a group, is uh, Professor Nermeen Shahata in accounting, who has just won the Abdul Hamid Shoman Award for this year. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Nermeen, for that. Let me, let me mention that we had not one, not two, not uh, three, but uh, a full, what, uh, 10 of our professors were cited by Stanford University, one of the top universities in the United States, working with the Elsevier uh, publishers. So on the Stanford University Elsevier uh, publishers list of the most impactful scientists in the world, the top 2% of the most cited scientists whose work gets the most attention in the world, we've got 10 of our people. And let me just mention their names because we hope to get together to celebrate in, in due course when we can under COVID. Uh, all of them, professor doctors, Hassan Azazi, in the chair of the chemistry department, professor of chemistry, Mohammed uh, Farag, uh, Tamar El Bhatt, professor of, and director of the graduate program of computer science and engineering, uh, Azadine uh, Sayed Ahmed Yazid, professor and director of the grad program in construction engineering, uh, Yahya Ismail in electronics and communications engineering, and he's also the director of nanoelectronics, uh, not only here at AUC, but it's shared with the whale city. Uh, Amal Esawi, professor also in mechanical engineering, Maki Habib, mechanical engineering, Mohi Mansour, mechanical engineering, Mohammed Suelem, physics, Nagi Alam, a professor of physics also. And of those 10, uh, two of them are also in another group of three, who got national level recognition here in Egypt, the State Award of Excellence for 2020, Hassan Azazi again and uh, Nage Alam, and also, or Alam, sorry, I'm reading it in English, and um, uh, Omar Abdelaziz, who's in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. That just shows, when I brag about our faculty, there's evidence for it. It's evidence-based bragging, so it's not really bragging at all. It's not just interpretation. We've got the, the uh, figures to show it. We also have students who are getting rec recognized at very high levels. The Minister of Higher Education just this past week recognized uh, two AUCNs among the 52 master's uh, thesis writers who were nominated and the 42 PhD thesis uh, writers who were nominated. Our own uh, Dina Fouad, the, who's an alumna of our master's program, Mechanical Engineering, her thesis was cited uh, and, and awarded by the minister. And Yasmin Abdel Maksud, uh, also in the environmental engineering program. Both of these are AUC women engineers, which also makes me very proud. We're helping to take a, a gender imbalanced profession and we're doing our bit as AUC to get the best engineers in there. And um, it's great that they're women engineers. Those kinds of things give us all grounds to be proud of the work we're doing, even in these uh, very, very difficult times. So I wanted to take just a minute to do that and we'll be celebrating each of these in appropriate fashion when we can do that as well. Let me mention one other thing at the, that affects all of us who are employees here, faculty and staff. We've been working very, very hard with the government of Egypt, as I think you all know, uh, regarding the uh, 
tax withholding requirement under national law. We're making very, very good progress on that. The Board of Trustees are following in closely. Um, I, I never want to overpromise, but I'm, I'm quite confident that thanks to the agreement that we already secured with the government of Egypt in May, and now the implementing agreement we're working on, we will come out of this in a way that uh, uh, people need not fear uh, that they'll be taking home less in their paychecks. That's, that's my aim. I'm pretty confident we're going to make that. I hope we can do even better than that. But I wanted to give people reassurance because I know everybody's very anxious about it. I think we're going to come out in a, in a very, very good place on that. And uh, with that, let me stop and, and let the rest of the, uh, the experts here discuss the important issues before us. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll stand by for any questions. Great, thank you. And we've gotten uh, several questions already. I think we'll start with the most pressing question, which has been on everyone's mind. And this is something that Provost Ahab sent out to us this morning, but I'll turn it over to him to give um, a brief explanation of the spring 2021 term, courses online, and what that semester will look like. Uh, thank you, Dr. Campana. Um, and uh, I will join the president in uh, uh, thanking everyone for their great effort uh, this semester and for planning for uh, uh, winter and fall 20, sorry, and spring 21. Uh, I also would like to join the president in con congratulating all of our faculty who won awards this year. So uh, for uh, the spring uh, 2021, and uh, as we uh, sent this early morning, uh, most of the, 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 the semester will be also will also be hybrid. We'll have more presence on campus than the fall. So the so far we have our plan to have 400 sections to be on campus either face to face or partially face to face. And those requests came from the faculty, and we accommodated all of the requests uh, contingent on the sp space uh, availability. And I'm sure that VP uh, Shinshaker will comment on that also. And I'm sure, I'm sure also that uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Ahmed Tolba will, com will comment on the methodology to reach to those numbers. So in reaching that decision, we have took into consideration uh, many, many aspects. Uh, one of them is the online learning and uh, the uh, success of online learning or, uh, and, and the issues also that we're facing with online learning. We also talked into uh, consideration uh, the opinion of the health experts about the situation in Egypt. Uh, and also we talked into consideration the needs of the faculty, the needs of the courses and the feedback from the students. Uh, we believe that this is the best uh, uh, um, decision uh, uh, with the current circumstances. And we're also flexible enough if the circumstances change to be, to be better or worse, uh, we are flexible enough to adjust our uh, teaching modality. And I would like to take that chance to thank all faculty for their hard work and thank also all of our students for their agility and resilience. Great, thank you. And I'll, I'll just direct a follow-up question to Ahmed Tolba. Um, who was on the faculty, who led the faculty study and the best methods to accommodate our face-to-face -face return. Agma, can you tell us just a little bit about the final design and those key determinant factors in which classes were allowed to move up back to campus? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Campana, and uh, thank you all. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, um, reiterate what the provost has mentioned right now that uh, we, are going to, we are going for a higher density campus versus the fall. Uh, this recommendation has not been, um, uh, we did not come up with this recommendation based on uh, just our thoughts, but we also, we had a poll uh, with, for, with, uh, for all our stakeholders, faculty and students. And it was very clear that students are eager to come back to campus, which is something that we respect and would love to accommodate whenever possible. Uh, we also um, uh, recognize that faculty, there are a good percentage of them that are, uh, are comfortable coming to campus. So, um, and the situation, the health situation has been fine. Uh, so we designed our model based on the fact that things are good. But of course, we are ready, as Provost mentioned, that maybe we can 
move back and back forward or backward if the situation or the health condition in Egypt gets diff differs. Uh, so the methodology is as follows. We first of all identify tiers based on the best practice. The first tier is the one that we applied in the fall uh, 2020, which is the courses that will require some partial face-to-face -face, uh, um, on-campus availability in order to satisfy their learning outcomes. Uh, uh, the second tier, which is the one that we are trying to increase this uh, in the spring, in addition to the first one, is the freshman courses, allowing students who are new, who have not experienced campus before, to have some courses on campus as well. So, and also the graduation projects and the thesis, which are have been pressing and students have been talking about them, and we hope to do that. Um, the first tier, by the way, includes labs, uh, studios, art um, uh, galleries, and stuff that really require hands-on experience or ha in order to achieve their objectives. And third is also, we talked about exams, which were the assessment in general were, were problematic and a lot of people were talking about them of, within the fall. We actually accommodated many exams in the, during the fall, although it was, they were not planned for earlier. And this, it, it, this, this was, was well received. And we plan to also um, accommodate exams, but now we plan them from the very beginning. So we received requests from schools uh, as long as they satisfied the criteria, all of them have been accommodated. Uh, our challenge was always to find the spaces, spaces for them. So, of course, we have to satisfy, to satisfy the two meter social distancing from both, from all the directions. Um, so this two meter is the guideline for spaces that are closed and people staying for a long period of time. And we cannot jeopardize the, the safety and health. Um, for, so to give you an idea, we have only eight halls that can accommodate more than 12 students given the social distancing. Yet we came up with a creative methodology whereby we did not limit the classrooms to the courses. We, we applied a shared classroom approach whereby the same classroom could be allocated to two courses. But let's say the two courses are, um, are taking a, um, uh, their time MR at 10 o'clock. One of them is only uh, um, taking their uh, their face-to-face -face classes in M and the other is taking it in R. So we doubled our capacity. So therefore we came up, we, we were able to accommodate up to 445 sections between labs, class classes and graduate courses. Uh, this represents about 20% or 21% of all the classes. Um, and I also want to assure the students who are eager to come to campus that 20% uh, of the classes does not mean 20% of the students. It's a possibility that uh, some students are taking one class, some students are taking three or four. So we may have um, um, uh, a good percentage of students who will have access to campus this time. Of course, this is spending the health condition remain uh, good. So um, uh, this is the situation. From the other side, I'm coordinating with VP Shireen Shaker, who is uh, also her team is doing a great job in try how to accommodate all this because we expect the campus tense density to increase, increase significantly versus the regular one. Tripling does not mean tripling the density, probably 10 to 12 times the density. So we, are, we, are, we need to um, um, make use of that. We can avail indoor and outdoor spaces and so on. So we are coordinating all this with her and we're hopefully coming up with the optimal plan. Um, finally, I would like to mention that um, uh, the schedule is ready on, uh, on, uh, on the website. Uh, it's, uh, we are denoting there whether the course is partial face-to-face -face SPF or EX, which has exam only. And, and this will allow the students to know beforehand so they will have the choice whether to um, uh, enroll in such courses uh, or not. And I would like to thank everybody in the task force and in the registrar because they have done a great job in a very short period of time to, to make this happen. And I hope that this plan will be accommodating all the needs and will hopefully have uh, a great semester ahead and wish everybody health and safety. And I look forward to a great semester, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Toba. I looked that up this morning as soon as the provost sent uh, the email out and I was really excited to see the number of courses. And I'm sure the students who have not yet had that opportunity will be really excited. It's a clear way to see which is meeting, which course is meeting partially on campus and which is not, and to perhaps make a decision based on some of those factors. I had, uh, I had Dr. Alozi going next, but I've just had a lot of questions from some students in the chat. So I thought I'd jump ahead to Dina Borai, 
Um, Dina, could you talk for a little bit about um, maybe special events, library access? There have been questions about can sports facilities and the gym be used on campus? And finally, of course, a question big on everyone's mind is, will spring commencement possibly happen? And then connected to that, what about a diploma distribution from students who would have gone through the graduation ceremony perhaps last year? Thanks. And you just have, yeah, there we go. Good. Sorry. So good, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to echo the, the president by saying, um, my team and I miss uh, students dreadfully. The campus is awfully empty without um, students and of course colleagues. Um, let me jump into the, um, um, the several questions and I don't know if I can remember them all, but I'll do my best. Um, regarding the, um, uh, I'll start with commencement. We have several graduations. We will not forget our, our um, wonderful spring 2020 um, graduates. Um, they've already um, gone and uh, they're probably working now, a lot of them, or some of them are um, serving, uh, doing their military service. So what I want to say is that we are going to have in the, fall, in the spring semester, we haven't yet determined the dates, three um, uh, ceremonies. We will have the ceremony for the spring 2020 graduates. We will have the distribution of diplomas, um, uh, graduations or ceremonies for the um, January, the fall, right now, the fall 2020, as well as the, um, the summer, what we usually do in June. We have not set dates because right now, as, as we all can see the uh, pandemic that is raging across the world and is also um, going up here in Egypt. So we, we will... All we will promise is, yes, we will have the three events for the three different um, uh, classes of students and um, exact dates have not yet been determined, but they will be in the spring semester. So that's one about the, the multiple commencements that we will be, or graduations we will be running. Then for the, um, the library access, um, in terms of what uh, the, the materials, all students have um, uh, access to the um, electronic materials in the library, a very rich source, as well as any print materials um, that they request are delivered to the gate and that's where they pick them up. Regarding physical access to the library for whatever reason, each student should write to their schools, to their academic school to arrange for access. Um, and uh, it is the school um, that will coordinate with the library to provide access to any student. Now, the third point is our um, stu the student events, the student clubs and activities, student organizations. Like this semester, in alignment with the um, provost and Dr. Tolba's um, uh, strategy, we have been running lo a low density um, uh, uh, series of um, um, student events, and we've approved a few. Um, and following the same approach, so inshallah in spring, we will um, in, um, uh, approve and um, help uh, organize more and additional events. Again, making sure working with um, VP Shirin and her team that uh, we, are, we are organizing the events following um, our COVID-19 uh, safety precautions that are, are working very well. Regarding the uh, student residences, the dorms, um, I don't want to cast the evil eye because I have been known to Cast evil eye on myself that um, so far so good regarding the student residences. We haven't had um, any cases so far, and I hope we remain so. We will uh, continue um, with, in next semester. We will have more uh, spaces. We are going to uh, expand more, and we will add a uh, again working with VP Shirin a testing program to accommodate um, um, more students. Uh, given that, um, as uh, we have heard, there will be more face-to-face -face classes. So this is um, one thing. And then there, is the, there was a question here about um, students who have face-to-face -face exams, can they uh, stay in the dorms? At this point in time, uh, for this semester and for the next semester, we have a very firm policy in place where the, only the dorm residents um, are allowed in the dorms. Other, and no visitors are allowed and no uh, one, uh, you know, a student staying overnight because again, regarding, uh, we have, to, we are vigilant regarding safety and uh, of our students. We, we have to be very, um, uh, a, a little bit rigid about this. So the answer is no. 
um, unfortunately. Um, hopefully, by next year, uh, uh, next fall, this will be all behind us with all the different vaccines. Regarding the sports facilities, we have, again, in line with our low density um, um, student life activities, we have provided access to the sports facilities to those to the dorm residences, uh, residents, and to the faculty who are also living um, uh, in plot three near the university, and to student athletes. So the small population uh, now um, is allowed into the student um, athletics facility. Next semester, there will be, um, we will start again in line with our strategy, we will start um, allowing more um, students in and we will have a system where they will sign up and they can um, have uh, opportunities to uh, to go to whatever uh, uh, sport whether the swimming pool or the um, gym or wherever whatever they want to um, utilize have i covered all the questions jillian i think you have and we have so many more questions so thank you dina i think i think we'll move on to dr alozi dr alozi there have been a few questions about the two surveys that that your office sent out to gauge information from students about the teaching and learning. Can you tell us, um, can you tell us what you learned from those and, and how they might make our work better? And you're muted, you just have to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there were two surveys actually, one of them was at the beginning, two, two weeks into the semester, and the results of this survey uh, in general thought, showed that students were satisfied and that's sort of to be expected because two weeks really don't indicate anything. They're still in the mode of, uh, you know, of getting in there and, and learning and so on. Um, then we had one in the middle of the semester, I believe it was October 24th or something of the sort. And, um, and again, the, the satisfaction of the students were, was not as, as great, but still nothing, nothing was really dramatically flagged. I can tell you what, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the results there, uh, about 1,928 students responded to the email and to the survey for every single one of their courses. That is about 29% of the response rate. It's not great, but it's not bad. Uh, but at the same time, and then that, that, that at the same time, the 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 most you know the the most um, complaint, if you wish, was the workload. But again, the numbers were not very high. Fourteen percent of that. Uh, then there is the 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 fact the ineffective communication. Another twelve seven percent deadlines. 7%. All of these are on the whole uh, low in terms of what sort of was expected compared to what we were starting to hear from the students themselves. And the students themselves have their own um, feedback, if you wish, with uh, their own uh, survey, with their own comments, and prepared some reports on that. And there, there the feedback was much more focused and on the whole, um, you know, were uh, pointing out to the challenges they were having in a way that that survey did not point out. So, uh, so that, you know, if you want to continue, that feedback was taken into account. We presented it to the Provost Council, we presented it to chairs and faculty uh, and all the faculty. And we've had since five uh, meetings, school-based sessions with student representatives and student modeling, uh, in which the, there was an exchange with their own deans, with their own uh, social provosts and their chairs. And I think the details that um, came out of it that were specific to every school were taken into account. Uh, and there the, the deans and the social deans have come up with certain recommendations based on that feedback which they've shared. So that is in a nutshell, the feedback in general, not, not just the uh, institutional feedback. Thank you. That's really great. Thank you. I, I would I would just add to that that just the reminder to students to to try to start with your professor. Um, I know that in Hus we often deal with students that kind of jump forward and and want to um, share a concern that they have directly with either the provost or the dean. And while we understand that that feels like it might get a quicker response, it it usually gets asked to go all the way back to the professor. 
your professors want to know when there's a problem. And so by starting to chat with them and to voice your concerns with them, it, you actually might get a, a quicker response that way. We really do genuinely want to hear your concerns and I know your professors do as well. So Councillor Hatem, I think uh, there's uh, been a few questions about uh, at vaccines, actually. We've had a few people just write about vaccine distribution and whether AUC will be involved in that in any way, what we might expect when we get around to that, hopefully this spring. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as, as we all uh, no, we are in the second wave of the uh, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, the uh, cases are still rising. And we we didn't reach the peak yet, but most of the cases are still mild. Some of them are moderate, but we are about 85 to 90 percent uh, mild cases. Uh, the vaccines, actually, uh, as uh, President Ricciardoni was saying, that it is the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, the vaccines will not be uh, will not end our uh, pandemic except after six to nine months from now. So uh, uh, the vaccine, uh, actually, as we have succeeded to get the uh, influenza, the uh, the uh, vaccine uh, to the campus, vaccines, according to the uh, WHO recommendations, and according to what is known as the Global Alliance for Vaccination, they they, they go to to uh, to governments and not to individuals. So we cannot AUC cannot uh, import vaccines uh, directly, and that's why. Uh, we can we, we, we can get vaccines when they are available. Uh, actually, the Egyptian government have uh, 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 was was the was this uh, Gafi uh, Gafi uh, alliance uh, has got uh, a, a, an agreement to get the the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the Oxford vaccine. Uh, once it is uh, there, uh, it will be available after two weeks in, in the UK, and within one or two months, it will be available in Egypt. Uh, it, will, it will get part of the Pfizer vaccine and also of the Chinese vaccine, which was in the clinical trial in Egypt. Uh, but again, the priority as all over the world, it is for those over 65 years, for the healthcare workers, and those who have risk factors. So if anybody from the AUC community is one of those uh, people, so he is, he is eligible, we can get for him the vaccine through our connections with the uh, Ministry of Health and the Vaxera company. And it is very, uh, very easy to get for, for them. So it is according to the priority and then it would be open for all the community. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, Shireen Shaker, I'm going to go to you and see if you can, uh, we've had several questions about how the university is managing uh, the higher density um, that's happening on campus. What are the precautions that we're taking and, and what can you tell those of us who are perhaps a little bit nervous to, to visit campus these days? Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. We've, um, since we've talked last time, we've done a number of measures. Um, concerning all the health and safety aspects. So we've launched a dashboard on the website where every week looking very closely at the numbers, in particular, the last seven day rolling average is a very key indicator that we are very seriously looking into week on week to uh, basically, you know, going back to what Tolba was sharing. Yes, we have a very good scenario in place, but we're also looking at the trends and are we going up, are we going down? We are going up those few weeks. Um, but again, we've not compromised all the, you know, we, we, we're, we're working very hard to maintain all the social distancing inside the social the classroom setups, disinfecting and cleaning between classrooms, all the transportation, also social distancing, nothing is, uh, you know, we've, we're at max going with 50% of the buses capacities. So all that is very much in place in um, to basically, in, in addition to all of that, we've, um, we've introduced the voluntary testing program. So we've, uh, we've announced that and every, um, once a week, we have stands at the dorms and at the plots 
uh, for, for faculty and students who want to get tested with the antibodies test that helps uh, looking at the past history of have I have, have I done with and gotten COVID-19 and finished with it or am I still am I, or am I still highly susceptible so this is also a measure that is uh, that is being uh, taken to to increase awareness as VP Dina was also uh, sharing that with the increased density we will be offering more and more testing both antibodies and PCR testing so these are things that we will be doing basically to cope with the increasing figures we are also working very actively with told us committee to basically in line with the numbers that are being projected to avail additional outdoor spaces um, uh, on campus so that students have places to sit in uh, you know in a safe manner between in between classes and or, or you know in um, or actually doing doing their actual uh, online classes also from more online more indoor seating so we're working on all these things to basically better equip our campus um, when when we go on a higher density to be able to absorb the numbers in a in a safe way. Um, I mean, we're, we're in terms of cleaning, we will as needed as the numbers are increasing. We are also um, uh, putting a few scenarios to increase our housekeeping staff and basically uh, make sure that we are um, uh, able to keep up with the schedules in between classes, cleaning and all that, we are taking that into account in our planning for the um, for the new semester. So I think that just an, you know, a closing comment, the dashboard is really helping us understand the numbers. The um, All the online health systems is, um, it, it is a hassle for most to enter campus. However, it gives us a lot of data and the clinic is able to follow up on the cases one by one of those red faces that come to the clinic are being followed up by the clinic. And this is ensuring that the people are being taken care of, you know, put on either the right medication or, uh, basically guided to the right to health insurance providers. So this is all um, a, a lot of effort, of course, but so we believe that it's paying out. We have not had an outbreak, thank God, and we did have a few classes that have been shifting to online, but I can say that there are just a few up until now, and this is also being done very rigorously, and we're looking at that, you know, week on week. So that's, um, that's basically in a nutshell what we're uh, doing. A lot of activity, a lot of synchronization between different teams and departments. Um, and we will continue to do that as we plan for the coming semester. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. And, and just to follow up with um, Sarah Rafat, if you can tell us, Sarah, there have been some questions from staff about uh, remote work policies. And as we're trying to bring more people on campus, how are we balancing that with staff who are perhaps um, maybe wanting to stay home and continue their work? How are we, how are we dealing with that? Uh, I would like actually first to take the opportunity to, to thank all our staff members for their hard work and effort during the full semester. Although uh, that we have uh, a small number of courses physically on campus, but we have a high number of staff uh, present on campus supporting all uh, campus activities and actually they are really following uh, the guidelines, the rules and regulations for entering campus uh, and uh, they are following all security and safety measures. Uh, thanks to the clinic for supporting our staff members in going uh, through this uh, journey as well because we have actually nearly one-to-one -one phone calls follow up from our clinic doctors about our staff and their safety uh, to enter the campus. Uh, uh, so thanks to them. Um, back to, to the question, as we are expecting uh, the increase of campus activities in the spring, this will automatically require additional physical presence for support staff to, to support the academic uh, mission. Uh, it will be uh, depending on each unit head and manager and dean in, uh, in the deciding the exact physical presence required uh, to accomplish his mission. Uh, but the normal expectation that this number will uh, increase. I just would like to highlight to all our staff to please make sure following all safety and security measures in order to prevent as much as possible an outbreak because we already have a high number of staff present on campus. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Aziza, I want to go to you for, for another question, which sort of balances uh, the, the many of the undergraduate students who seem to be really eager and anxious to get back to campus. There are also a number of graduate students who have really enjoyed having the opportunity to, to conduct their classes remotely. 
do you envision that in the future we might have some programs or so, some courses, particularly for graduate students that are online only? Um, actually, this is one of the um, questions that we are uh, looking at in the advisory committee on uh, digital education. And uh, so we are looking very closely at how to develop a framework. We're developing a framework when that happens uh, for both gra graduate and undergraduate, but certainly the idea is to focus on graduate uh, studies or the graduate education because that's where the demand is great, would be greatest. And so my, uh, if you'd want my own personal opinion, yes, I think that that's something that may happen in the, I don't know what the near future or the <laughs> almost near future. Uh, thank you. That's great. Uh, before I get to the next question, I just want to remind everyone because we've seen several questions on the Q&A about which courses are offered partial face-to-face -face on campus. So the provost sent out an email to the entire AUC community this morning with a link to find uh, the listing of the spring courses. So that is now available, that is live. And if you have any question about which one of your courses might possibly be meeting partially face-to-face -face on campus in spring 2021, you can find that out right there and you can find it out today. So for the next question, this is, I think what many of you are curious about and several of you wrote it into the Q&A just now. I'm gonna to go to Provost Dehab. What, where are we standing on the possible pass fail option for either this semester or in the future? Uh, I think we're, I think the, your camera might have froze. So maybe if we turn off your camera, we'll start over. He's Are also, you there? Uh, oh, yeah. I let's just give him a minute and see if that works. And if not, on, yes, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Provost Ahab. Can you start over with that? question that I know everyone's eager to hear the answer to. Sure, yes. I so think he's I, asking I me that, to... I know this is a very uh, um, uh, important question and actually our students have been asking us that over email in the last few days. Uh, and uh, we have discussed that issue at depth with the academic leaders and that means all deans, associate provosts and all chairs. And the conclusion of uh, that uh, discussion was uh, that uh, we will continue with our grading system as is without adapting pass and fail this semester. However, the discussion started again and last Thursday, the Provost Council uh, started to discuss the issue again. And we know that the students uh, are meeting with the Senate tonight. And we were waiting for the results of that meeting to see if there are any new evidence that uh, pass and fail would be uh, a solution. So far, we don't see it as a solution for the current uh, issues or concerns of the students when it comes to online learning. Uh, then we will uh, uh, meet again as a Provost Council to discuss that. But let me also say that we received many concerns from our students, as Aziza mentioned a minute ago, about online learning. Those concerns are some, some of them are general concerns, some of them are concerns concerns for a specific faculty member or a specific course. And we have addressed all of them. And we know that deans and associate deans are in contact with the faculty to address uh, the remaining of those concerns. And I urge our students, if they have a concern about online learning, to reach out to their faculty first. If the issue is not solved, they should reach to the chair of the department. If it's not solved, then they can raise that up to the dean and the provost and we will be happy to work with the faculty member and the particular school on sol solving those concerns. Let me also add that <clears throat> online learning is not a choice. We did not choose to go to that modality uh, because we want to do that. It's something that actually we have to do it in order to save the semester for our students. And that's why we have to show all of us as a community, we have to come, come together and show more ability and more diligence in order to that period. Once the vaccine is out, 
And once we feel uh, safe that our people can come back to campus, we will be happy to bring everyone back to campus. That's what, that's what we want to do. We want everyone back to their offices, to their classrooms, to the plaza. We want the campus humming as it was before. Uh, and with that, I plea again for our community, faculty, staff, and students to uh, stay safe, be more agile, and be more resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Dehab. I think that's a, a good reminder for, for students to follow that process, to start any concern with a, your faculty member. And then if it still isn't addressed, it goes to the chair of that department and then it goes to the Dean's office. It, it is, I know it, it may seem like it's a frustrating process, but it, it is the way to most quickly and most efficiently get your concern um, answered. So thank you for that. I wanna go to Councillor Ashraf Hatem and uh, there've been a couple questions recently and some earlier as well. With concerns, I think in, in in Egypt in general and the possibility of a partial or complete lockdown again this winter as we see cases going up and again hitting sort of the marks that we saw earlier in April when we had that partial lockdown. Do you have any information about that for the AUC community? Um, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, up to now, the, the government is not aiming for complete lockdown. Uh, but if uh, in, a, in a certain place, there are uh, several cases, uh, they can uh, close a classroom, a, uh, a building for a few days, and then they will come back for, for it. But uh, a complete or even this uh, 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 partial lockdown, which happened also in, in uh, last year, uh, the government is not intending to do this. Uh, as I told you, up to now, the cases are, there are several cases, but, and they are increasing, but they are not severe cases. The hospitals are still, there are plenty of beds, the ICU beds are there. And uh, uh, something also which is, which is good uh, in a study in, in Egypt, which was just recently published last week, uh, we had about 25% of our youth population has a protective IgG uh, uh, levels, and this is something which is good. So uh, uh, we are hoping that we are in the way of herd immunity in Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question about lab fees, and I'm not sure who, who could answer that, if we can answer that now. It's also up to anyone who, any of the panelists who might be able to answer that in the chat. But the question was concerning uh, if students are actually not attending a lab, but still paying a lab fee. And if that is the case, then where, where, what is happening with those fees right now? Who would like to take that? Provost, I mean, sure, I will take it. I was looking for if um, our CFO is with us, so can I, uh, so I can ask him to take that uh, question. Lab fees does not really represent the full cost of the lab. It represents a small fees to make sure that the lab is supplied with the, the right supplies and also uh, 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 right electronics if it's an electronic lab or something like that. So those are a minimum fee to maintain the lab uh, running. And uh, uh, many of our labs were offered partially face-to-face. -face. Many of them were offered uh, also online. In order to offer online, we acquired a specific software uh, or softwares in order to allow the students to use the lab at a distance. And that request that actually uh, uh, cost the university some money too. So, um, I will be happy to discuss the lab fees with our uh, uh, CFO. However, uh, uh, for uh, this semester, uh, the lab fees stays as is and we did not change it. 
Great, thank you. And I'm still seeing some comments in the Q&A from students still asking about the um, pass fail. And I think the provost was really clear that, that that meeting is going to happen. And so right now we we have said that we are going back and hearing your, hearing your thoughts and continuing that discussion. It is not a discussion that is closed by any means, uh, but we don't have the answer right now in, the, in this campus conversation. There is another question, um, and I know we're almost toward the end of this. We really appreciate all of you sticking around. Uh, this is about alumni and alumni access to campus, and in particular, the library. Dina, do you know if, if alumni have access to library books in this time, and how would they go about getting those? Uh, I actually, uh, Dr. Campana, if I may, uh, yes, ask, please. I ask Dr. Lozi to answer that because she was in discussion with the Dean of Library about that last night, actually. Perfect, thank you. Dr. Lozi? Yeah, I, I, I will answer what I know, and I also would like Ahmed Tulba to join in because I think he may know also part of it. My understanding is that anybody that is uh, given permission to um, buy somebody on the on campus to access campus, then they would be they would be allowed to do so. Uh, I also know that for our students, and this is where I don't I don't have an answer for the alumni, that if they need some particular um, uh, resource of sorts, uh, and they are not allowed on campus, then the the library would give it to them at the Pepsi Gate. Uh, unfortunately, I really don't know what the, the, the policy is for alumni. If they manage to get a permission from somebody on campus, then that would, they would be a visitor. So like any other visitor. So that's the best I can give. If Ahmed Tulba has a, another answer, then I'd be happy to, to listen. I, I, I can compliment that, uh, Dr. Lozi. Uh, actually, if our alumni has, the, has uh, uh, the privilege to borrow from the library, they will have also the same access for our students to order the book and they will receive it at the gate and you can return it afterwards. Uh, of course, as you all know, the book when it's returned, it has to be guaranteed for some time before it gets borrowed again for safety, uh, obvious safety reasons. Uh, so uh, I hope that answers the questions for our alumni. And let me assure you again for all of our students, graduate and undergraduate, the library, you don't need a library, physical library access to get library resources from EUC. If you request the resources, you will get it either electronically or physically at one of our, at, at Pepsi Gate. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Tolba? No, I concur with the, the same answer. Wonderful, great. So we, we're, we want to hear uh, from President Ricciardoni one more time before we end this cam campus conversation, but to reiterate that um, we know many of you have typed in questions. We haven't been able to get to all those questions. What I tried to do was uh, prioritize and group when there were many, many questions about the same issue. We asked those. Some of your questions are very, very specific, and we've taken note of those, and we will do our very best to get back to you individually to let you know if you have something that is um, about a very specific thing that might not involve a lot of people. But what I'd like to do right now is hear some closing comments from President, President Ricciardoni, as well as leave it to any of the panelists if there's something that you were unable to share that you feel is perhaps a top priority that you want to communicate to uh, students and faculty and staff and mass in this campus conversation. We can do that in the next minute or two and then we'll go to President Ricciardoni for the closing remarks. Anyone have anything they'd like to add that is sort of large scale and we were not able to get to today? All right. President Richardoni. I neglected to mention at the outset when I was talking about the uh, among the things to be proud of, you know, there's a risk in citing any because there's really so many accomplishments by our students, faculty, and staff. But I really had meant to mention something uh, that's not new news because we've known it for a week or 10 days. And I've, I've spoken about it elsewhere. And that is that our own uh, counselor, Dr. Ashraf Hatem has uh, won election to the parliament of Egypt, high national office. And I think that's a, 
a huge recognition by the, uh, the government of Egypt and the people of Egypt of the uh, talent there and the dedication to national service that he has shown long before coming to AUC, while he's at AUC and, uh, and, and going forward. So congratulations to you, Dr. Ashraf. Bitaufiq, uh, inshallah. It's, it's not an easy additional task, even if that was all you were doing. Um, I wanted to touch on, uh, Jillian, uh, Dr. Jillian, thank you for your uh, masterful squeezing in of answers to uh, most of the questions. We will uh, take it on ourselves to get back to those who have asked the uh, questions uh, that we haven't been able to address directly. I'll touch on one that I saw on the Q&A list because it, it comes up all the time. Uh, the provost touched on this uh, in, with respect to the lab fees. Uh, uh, the cost of operating this university far exceeds in normal times the tuition that we charge. Everybody, even if you're not a scholarship student, is getting a subsidy, uh, uh, a substantial one. Uh, tuition pays for only about uh, two thirds of our operating costs. The rest comes from various sources, uh, grants, gifts, uh, corporations, foundations, high net worth individuals, and the endowment that uh, has been funded basically by those same sources over the years. Um, some foreign, some American government funding, some European Union funding, et cetera. So um, keeping this university operating, even when we cannot be physically present, we, we, under, we do realize some savings, but the, the savings are not enough to offset the costs by a long shot. So we've been able to retain our, our workforce. We've not um, you know, shed workers or, or uh, employees. We've, we've held on to keep people through these difficult times. Uh, and so all sad to say, we've, we've not been able to reduce the cost. We would love to pass on the savings to our students. We'd love to increase the salaries of our faculty and staff. Um, it, it is a very stressful situation in, in the world of not-for-profits in good times. And these are not good times uh, with COVID. So we uh, very much appreciate that the students do not feel that they're getting the full experience that they all expected. Um, that is absolutely true. That's a valid uh, feeling and, and observation. We all feel that. Um, we all miss having our students here. And we wish we could provide the on-campus face-to-face experience. Unfortunately, our costs of, of providing the progress, the continuing progress in the educational journey remain there. We have to continue you know, paying our people and uh, operating this university, even when we can't have our students on, on campus with us. So I know that that doesn't re make anybody feel any better, but it, that's the truth. That's the explanation. Again, thanks to everybody for participating today. Thanks to the uh, faculty and staff for bearing up and, and putting working all the harder to be, enable us to, to serve our students. Thanks to the students for uh, um, hanging in there and dealing with the incredible stresses and strains. This is something that's gonna mark your cohort, your, your generation for life. You'll look back on it. I hope you won't experience any more pandemics. I hope it'll be a once in a hundred year experience, but Lord knows um, whether the world has changed and this is something we'll all deal with. Yours will be a cohort known for its toughness, for its resilience, its ability to deal with anything. And um, uh, you'll come out at what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So keep that in mind. Keep, keep the faith. Keep confident. Uh, we'll get through this. And you'll come out of this all the better for it with something to talk about, hopefully uh, with, with pride and satisfaction for having come through it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for taking this valuable time out of your day to listen. And if we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with that. We appreciate your time. Have a great afternoon and good week. Thank you.